I spent a portion of my time in seminary at the Irish College in Rome. As a child, I had loved all the stories of those ancient civilizations like the Greeks, the Egyptians and the Romans. And when I went to study there in Rome, I'd never been to Rome before. I was picked up at the airport in Rome by one of the seminary staff. And on our way back to the Irish College, the route he took meant that we drove right past the Colosseum. And all these years later, I still remember the excitement of seeing it in real life for the first time. The Irish College in Rome is not much more than about a five or six minute walk from the Colosseum. And so a few hours later, I walked down the hill to go and see the Colosseum and I was standing there in front of it. I was amazed that I was actually standing there, right in front of centuries of history, for it's nearly seven or 2,000 years old at this stage. The university where I studied was nearly a half hour walk from the Irish College. And as I settled into the studies, the route to class each day meant I had to walk right past the Colosseum. In the beginning, for the first week or so, I would marvel at the vastness of this large stadium, which was a testament to the ingenuity and skill of master builders of the long-gone Roman Empire. But slowly but surely, as I passed it twice a day on my way to and from class, I began to not take much notice of it. Somehow, because the Colosseum was always there, and because I had become so familiar with it, it had lost some of the wonder that it first inspired in me. I knew its story. I knew how marvellous and historic it was. And I could have told all of that to anyone who would come to visit for a few days. But most of the time during those five years that I was in Rome, I just walked past it. It might as well have been invisible. In the first reading today, we have the account of the Lord providing a wondrous and miraculous bread for the people of Israel. For the entire 40-year journey they made through the desert, the manna bread appeared every morning for the people to gather up and feed upon. We are told in the Bible that it is only on the day that they entered the Promised Land that God's daily delivery of the manna bread ceased. The people are hungry and have been grumbling to Moses about how they were in danger of dying of hunger and how it might have been better to be after a life of a slave, at least with a full belly, dying in Egypt than to be free but starving to death out of Egypt. God intervenes and provides this special heavenly bread for them. And the people are amazed at what God provides, or at least for a while they are amazed. Though we don't hear of it in the first reading today at Mass, in the book of Numbers, which also recounts the people's journey through the desert, we're told that they eventually complained to Moses about the miraculous bread, saying, we are sick of this unsatisfying, miserable food. And that wasn't the only time they had complained about the heavenly bread. But by this time it had been given to them for years. And so they went from being well fed with heavenly bread to being fed up with it. The extraordinary had become ordinary. And in becoming ordinary, it had become for them contemptible. They were so used to it that they failed to appreciate, appreciate its significance, its miraculous nature, and its being a testament to the goodness and providence of God who, as the psalm in today's Mass tells us, gave them bread from heaven. Mere men ate the bread of angels. All of us must fight the temptation and tendency to treat that which is extraordinary, heavenly and holy as though it were something ordinary, mundane, and of no real significance. And nowhere is that tendency more likely to creep in on us 
than in the Mass, which is our highest and most powerful form of worship, prayer, and praise of God, and in the Holy Eucharist, which is the highest and most powerful way to union and intimacy with God. Day after day, week after week, the Israelites ate the bread of angels, and that familiarity unfortunately led them to be fed up with it and to treat it with contempt, even though it was the only thing that was keeping them alive in the harsh years of the desert wanderings. And while our familiarity with the Mass and the Holy Eucharist will please God never lead us to treat it with contempt, it can lead us to a place of complacency if we do not regularly examine our attitudes towards these most sacred mysteries and ask the Lord to increase in us faith and what Pope John Paul II called Eucharistic amazement. And no one is in more danger of having that spiritual complacency with regard to the Mass and the Eucharist than me as a priest. For us priests, these holy mysteries are, you might say, the stock and trade of our daily lives. The extraordinary is our daily duty. And because we who perform these sacred duties are ourselves so ordinary, we can begin to forget that these duties, these holy mysteries we celebrate, are anything but ordinary. About the Mass, Cardinal John Henry Newman wrote, To me, nothing is so consoling, so piercing, so thrilling, so overcoming as the Mass. It is the greatest action that can be on earth. Christ is present, he before whom angels bow and devils tremble. And about the Holy Eucharist, St. Augustine tells us, I dare to say that God, though he is all-powerful, could not give us more. Though he is all-wise, knows not how to give us more. Though he is rich in all things, has not more to give than the Holy Eucharist. Lord, Give us the grace that our familiarity with the extraordinary gift of the Mass and the Eucharist may never breed complacency. We may always approach this sacred mystery with the utmost reverence, stirring up in ourselves an awareness of the greatness that is you the bread of life.